I am Ashwath Kumar. I am a fourth year law student. Hello, I'm Vashni Vigarwal. I'm a third year BA Global Affairs student. Yeah. We will be the student anchors for today's guest lecture. We warmly welcome you all to the fourth guest lecture of the online guest lecture series, which is being organized in collaboration with the German Academic Exchange Service, DAD. Uh, today's talk is based on the book titled Melina, written by the Austrian author Ingeborg Bachmann. She was a poet, a novelist, and a playwright born on 25th June 1926 in Klagenfurt, Austria. Her father, Matthias Bachmann, was a school teacher who later became a Nazi functionary in Hitler's army. She studied philosophy, German studies, and psychology at the University of Innsbruck, Graz, and Vienna. She began her writing career in the 1940s and 1950s and became one of the leading figures of the post-World War II literature movement in Austria. She won the prize of Group 47 in 1953 for her poetry collection, Deferred Time. Bachmann had several relationships throughout her life, including with the famous poet of Romanian Jewish origin, Paul Salan, and the Austrian author, Mark Frisch. Bachmann died on October 17, 1973, at the age of 47, just two years after her publication of the book, Malina. Under unknown circumstances after a fire broke out in her apartment in Rome. Although it is said that the fire started after she fell asleep while smoking in bed, the cause of the fire was never fully determined. And that has been, there have been many speculations that it may have been an act of suicide. In her last decade, she began work on a series of novels bound together by the title Ways of Dying. She completed only the first book, which she named Malina. In Malina, Bachmann portrays how female subjectivity in a patriarchal system is menaced and ultimately extinguished. In a somber, surreal style of writing, the unknown narrator is shown to deal with a failed love relationship with a person called Ivan and her disenchantment with her father and her final submission to her male alter ego, the eponymous Malina. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to, to you today an accomplished academic and an expert in her field, Dr. Shruti Jain. Dr. Jain is an associate professor at the Center of Foreign Languages at the Opry Jindal Global University in Sonipat, India. She completed her PhD at the Center of German Studies, JNU, New Delhi, where she explored the Indian reception of Friedrich Nietzsche. Her extensive, her extensive research in this area has contributed significantly to the understanding of the impact of Nietzsche's philosophy on Indian thought. Interestingly, it is Nietzsche's ambivalent remarks about women and feminism that acted as a catalyst for her to delve deeper into German women's studies. That is when she also conceived the idea of our course on German women's writing. I now invite Dr. Jen to deliver her introductory notes today and take over as chair for the rest of the session. Thank you, Ashwat. Thank you, Vaishnavi. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I too would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you to the fourth guest lecture of uh, the online guest lecture series on German women's writing. I know you're all very keen to listen to Professor Madhusani, but since I will also be sharing the session today, I would like to take your permission uh, to take a little longer than my usual 10 minutes to recapitulate the learnings from the previous guest lecture and sound a few themes that anticipate and contextualize today's text. <clears throat> Last Monday, Dr. Anupande gave an insightful talk on Marlene Haushofer's novel, The Wall, in which she reiterated the various ways in which Haushofer, although not completely devoid of human-centric stereotypes, did open a path for looking at non-human animals as beings who deserve to be acknowledged in their own right. While making a case for non-reductionist view of animals and animality, Dr. Anupande also referred to Derrida's playful coinage of the term animo, which means that the term animality is a construct beyond the human animal binary, plural, discursive, a space where the animal, both human and non-human actually coexist. It can hence be deduced that the narrator of the novel is not just a female human, but a female human animal. While writing for mice, 
she not only deals with an outer animal gaze, but also deals with her own inner animality. That is with aspects of her own self that the dog, the cat, and the cow also becomes manifestations of. That a woman and animals are stranded on one side of the invisible wall is an ingenious way to my mind of showing the connection between the human domination of animals and the male domination of women. The invisible wall then also symbolizes bias and discrimination against non-males and non-human animals. The organic bonding that the narrator shares with the animals she lives with could also be understood as, term, as coming to terms with her own instincts and desire for attaining self-autonomy. By causing all the male species, including Lux and Stier, to die in the end, Haushofer contrives a dystopian utopia, a manless woman's world, where the human female animal crosses paths with the non-human animals thereby interrupting the epoch of man's domination. Interestingly, many motives in the wall recur in Malina too. Besides the painful dreams and the murder motive, the effaced identity of the narrator, the figure of the dog, and the metaphor of the wall accompany us here as well. In the second chapter, the unknown narrator dreams of brutal ill treatment of her mother and herself, by her father, where she compares her mother to a dog who, I quote, completely submits to his thrashing. The mother's alliance with the father is compared to the unabashed loyalty of a dog and its misogynistic submission to the master. <clears throat> then we have the wall. In the end of the novel, the eye vanishes into a crack in the wall in her apartment, leaving behind Malina thus hinting at the final loss of female voice in a male-dominated world. Both texts end with murder. In the wall, it is the murder of all that is male. In Malina, however, it is the female voice that relinquishes itself. Today's talk steers us to another very vital discourse in women's studies, which explores the connection between space and construction of identity. Though the title of today's talk is short, Malina, a Viennese novel, and might come across as unobtrusive, I think it is very, very inspiring. So much so that it drove me to, discourse, to discover a treasure, namely one of Egon Schiele's paintings called Dämon der Stadt, or City in Twilight, which he created in 1913. The painting this depicts the city, Chesky Krumlov, the city Schiele's mother hailed from. But that is not what the painting is famous for. <clears throat> what makes this painting interesting and even relevant for our talk today is its connection with its first owner, Elza Kodicek, a Jewish woman who lived in a prosperous section of Vienna near the foothills of the Alps, where the Nazis who had annexed Austria confiscated her home in 1940. An SS German officer named Herbert Gabing soon moved into her house with his family. Sensing the impending danger of being deported, Elsa Kodicek fled, only to come back and hide in a room upstairs in her own house where the painting of Egon Schiele hung earlier, before it was confiscated and sold off by the Nazis. The painting hence became a symbol for the hiding place of a Jewish woman. This reminds us of the title of the novel that we're discussing today, Malina. The character of Malina, who we are, told, we are told in the beginning of the novel, is an author of an apocrypha that is no longer available in bookstores. The Greek word apocryphon means hidden. Sarah Lennox points out the Slavic roots of the word Malina, which means a raspberry, a fruit within which multitudes of seeds are hidden. Also, Malina was the code word for a hiding place in ghetto language, a secret expression known only to those inside the Jewish community. By choosing a feminized name like Malina for the ambivalent male protagonist, a word that is also so intricately connected with the Jewish experience of fear and survival during the Holocaust, Bachmann aptly shows the connection between the experience of women's oppression with in within the fascism uh, inherent in patriarchy. 
Now, speaking of the connection between space and women's studies in the 1980s, following the works of Foucault and Lefebvre, scholars began to emphasize the relationship between space and the construction of identity. This led to the so-called spatial turn across the humanities and social uh, sciences. Feminist scholarship and historic, historians of gender too have played a full part in this turn. They have recognized as Linda McDowell has argued that mapping of a place or location onto gender identities has been a key part of the establishment and maintenance of women's position and is reflected in both the materiality and symbolic representation of women's lives. Space, it is said, is dynamic, constructed and contested. It is where issues of sexuality, race, class and gender amongst myriads of other power knowledge struggles are cited, created and fought out. Now, those of you who have been to the city of Vienna certainly also know of the several measures the Viennese government has taken to make Vienna a more inclusive and a gender equal city. Today, the city has improved street lighting, made parks more accessible for young girls, adapted cemeteries that are mostly visited by old women to their needs, constructed more widened pavements and designed social housing and new neighborhoods for needs of women and carried out gender awareness campaigns where pictures from common signs were used and reversed by gender. For example, changing the signs showing a man changing the diapers of a baby or showing women working in construction, with construction, etc. But clearly the Vienna of Bachmann's time was not the same as today's Vienna. Post-war Vienna was indeed a space not without problems. The rather undemocratic restoration of Austrian, Austria's national identity by the Second Austrian Republic in its initial stages, often referred to as Stammtisch politics, and the lack of acknowledgement of the Moscow Declaration, which said that Austria and Austrians too had to take responsibility for their participation in the war crimes of the Third Reich, deeply impacted the lives of people who were still struggling with their Nazi pasts. Bachmann highlights in her work the question of guilt, the silence over war crime, implying that the brutality of the Nazis and the cold instrumental reason carried over into the post-war era in the absence of a genuine discourse of Vergangenheitsbewältigung. Like Berlin, Vienna of the 50s too became a schauplatz of black marketing, prostitution and crime. Right after the economic reforms, however, normalcy returned, the so-called normalcy, but only in the form of excessive consumerism and a certain Americanization of the city. Modern day Vienna now became a site for tourists and the multicultural, multi-ethnic nature of the Austro-Hungarian empire was silenced by the loud uproar of commodification of Vienna. It is hence not without any reason that Bachmann situates her narrative in an unseeming street, street such as the Ungar Gasse. So how did these historical developments in the space that was Vienna impact women? What role does the city of Vienna play in building or breaking female subjectivity in the novel Malina? To discuss these questions and many others, we have amongst us Professor Madhusani from the Center of German Studies, School of Languages, Literature and Cultural Studies, JNU. Professor Sani has been teaching at the JNU since 1984. Her research interests include feminist literary studies, literary translation and critical language pedagogy. In 2000, she published Zum Geschicht uh, Geschichtsverständnis Heinrich Manns in seiner essayistischen Arbeit 1905 bis 1955. She edited the Goethe Society of India yearbook between 2012 and 2015, and has, along with Namita Khare, edited an anthology of translated texts from German into Hindi, Ek Ajnabi Simulakat. A second volume of translated texts titled Vistapan Smriti Sanskritik Nagrita Kathatmak or Saidhantik Part, co edited with Shambhavi Prakash and Lipi Viswas is in process of being published by Vani Prakash. Friends, Professor Madhusani was like many others present in this virtual gathering today, also my teacher at the JNU, who introduced us to the world of German women's writing. And I feel sheer joy reliving that moment with you, Madhu. And to have you speak to my students today makes the moment even more special. 
I thank you from the bottom of my heart for having accepted my invitation to speak in this lecture series. And with these words, I would now like to call you upon the virtual stage for delivering your talk. Over to you. Thank you so much, Shruti, for inviting me and thank you for the very kind introduction. I think I'd be overreaching myself if I say I've really worked on the space issue because Marlena itself is such a rambling text that I think I shall ramble along Marlena today, you know, along with the old text. So I'm not very sure. You said some really, really relevant and interesting things. Um, and yes, I too um, do think that Sarah Lennox is one of the most interesting um, researchers on who has worked on Bachmann, you know, because um, who has tried to take it a little outside in that sense. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, the DRA, for sponsoring this event. And Shruti, then maybe I can start, yeah? Okay. Um, in 1976, the Ingeborg Bachmann Prize was instituted by the city of Klagenfurt, one of the most important literary prizes in the German-speaking world. To commemorate her 50th death anniversary, the National Library of Austria has organized a special exhibition paying tribute to the writer. And this is happening between November 22 and 23. Innumerable films have been made on her works, the latest being Rise in die Wüste, Journey into the Desert, 2023, by Margareta von Trotter. Earlier in 1973, Gerda Haller made Ingeborg Bachmann im Erstgeborenen Land. It's a documentary in 80, 1987. The Case of Franza or the Book of Franza was filmed by Zava Schwarzenberger. Ruth Beckerman made Die Geträumten in 2016 about the relationship between Ingeborg Bachmann and Paul Sela. And now this latest by Margareta von Trotter is really about uh, Ingeborg Bachmann's relationship with Max Frisch. These are just a few of the innumerable ways that indicate that in the Bachmann reception, her life and persona were at least as important as her work. Her personal life continues to fascinate not just her poetry and prose. Bachmann's poetry brought her, her attention in 1952 with a reading at the gathering of Grupa 47. Hans Werner Richter writes that her demeanor was nervous, sensitive, shy, and seemingly helpless. When she decided not to write poetry anymore in the 50s and moved to prose, many male critics were swift to dismiss her prose as trivial. Marcel reich Ranitsky, the Pope of German literature, as he was called, famously referred to Bachmann as the fallen poet. And a prose, according to him, was an expression of emotional rebellion against the world as a whole and hence had no tangible relation to reality. In fact, at the time when Marlena appeared and did become a bestseller, as it were, Eric Segal's love story, Segal's love story had just appeared. And there were frequent allusions to this in the reception of Marlena in the press. Just another brief reference to how male critics responded to Marlena in, um, in the 70s when the book appears. Here I uh, quote Rudolf Hartung, whose review appeared in Die Zeit in 1971. He says, where only the subjective feeling counts and feelings that cannot be controlled by any reason and are therefore almost anarchic, plot and structure lose their meaning because for pure subjectivity, they too are something external. And Joachim Kaiser in his review called it a radically outmoded, elitist, amusing psychoanalytic drama in the Süd Deutsche Zeitung in 1971. In 1983, Elke Atzla made a catalog of seven points about how the book was received. And I'll just mention two here. It did not acknowledge how time and society were represented in the novel. And it dismissed the idea of female discourse that was intrinsic to the novel. The iconization of Ingeborg Bachmann during her lifetime and the myth created around her persona after her death can be seen in the reception of the film Marlena made by Werner Schröter in 1991. The script was written by Elfrieda Jelinek. Controversy arose around the dominant motive of fire in the film, which many critics took, took to be a reference to the way Ingeborg Bachmann died. In 1973, when after her death, Heinrich Böll wrote, I believe no one should be too hasty in associating Ingeborg Bachmann's terrifying manner of death with her planned cycle of novels or in seeking in her work allusions to and foreboding 
of a death by fire. The apprehension expressed here was, sorry, was probably justified when one thinks of how often the manner of her death has been linked with her work. Of course, there's the other problem in this text, which Heinrich Böhl writes, and you could read it today under the title, Ich denke an sie wie an ein Mädchen. I think of her as a girl. Yet another cliche which surrounds the myth of Ingeborg Bachmann during her lifetime. This Spiegel cover page from 1954 just fed into this. And I'd like to just then share my um, slides, if I may. Now, I just brought this image simply because it's quite astonishing that how many versions of Malina have Ingeborg Bachmann on the cover page. I was trying to figure out whether this is a common thing, but I didn't find it. And even when the, it's, it's a her book, even when it's in the her Verlag or any other manifestation, you will always have Ingeborg Bachmann in some image or the other. And I, it is a slightly problematic issue, I find. I mean, in this last image, you have her with the mirror, which of course is another iconic scene from the novel Malina itself. No? And the innumerable images like this. Now I go to the next. Now this was the Spiegel cover and it's uh, it's quite an interesting image, isn't it? Because you have the red and, you know, instead of making her that fairy tale princess as she was always called, from they made her into this stark, severe looking person. But again, you know, selling her image as it were, selling the image of this woman writer, you know, whom they wish to categorize in a certain way. I mean, that's what it appears to be. So to continue, Marlena is, as Ingeborg Markman herself says, a spiritual imaginary autobiography, part of the in incomplete triptych of the Todes Arten cyclus, cyclus death styles. How do we read Bachmann's novel published in 1973 as Indian readers of German literature? Before reading ba Marlena, I had read Der Fallfranza, a second novel from the Todes Arten cyclus, which remained a fragment and had been troubled by some and I had been troubled by some of the images evoked in both these texts. In the second chapter of Marlena, the narrator says, I'm wear, I am wear, wear, wearing the Siberian Jewish coat like everyone else whilst waiting deportation. And in the nightmares of being murdered by her father, there are images that evoke the killing of the Jews during the Nazi period in Germany, in Germany and Austria, images of gas chambers, experiments with freezing human beings, et cetera, everything that came out of the fascist, the Nazi experiments. And in the book, Franza, she says, the whites are coming, I am of an inferior race. This book, the book of Franza was to remain a fragment. And she writes, I mean, this is slightly longish, the quote. In Australia, the Aborigines have not been exterminated and yet they are dying out and the clinical examinations are unable to find the organic causes. There is a deadly despair among the Papuans, a kind of suicide, because they believe that the whites have magically seized all their goods. And have the Incas really been destroyed only by these cruel bandits, by these few? And this leads her to conclude, I am a Papuan. In her reading of this section of Fal Franza, as well as the entire death cycles, Sarah Lennox shows how Bachmann represents imperialism past and present as a component of history central to the constitution of the characters. One cannot argue with this. However, France's identification or that of the narrator with the other side of history may be debated. Must be debated. In an interview, Bachmann, and this I've taken Sarah Lennox's translation, she says, for me, it is one of the oldest, if almost inaccessible memories that I always knew I had to write this book very early already when I was still writing poems, that I constantly searched for the main character, that I knew it would be male, that I could only narrate from the standpoint of a male character. But I often ask myself why. I didn't understand in the stories earlier either, which she had written, why I off, why not often had to be a male eye? It was like finding my character to be able not to deny this female eye and nonetheless to emphasize the male eye. This comes in the Gespräche on interviews also. For Bachmann, this novel, Malina, 
was to have been an overture for the remaining books in the Todas Atmi Sutras, which of course never really happened. Bachman calls I, Malina, that figure in her book, a Twitter figure, an androgynous figure, a doppelganger, co-joined, producing two intertwined but tremendously opposed figures, which cannot be without each other and which must always be against each other. The narrator reflects that Ivan, Ivan, you know, Ivan, 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 will never realize I am a double. I am also Malina's creation. Is only the Malina an extension of the, of the I, or is Ivan too another alter ego of the I? In an interview, Bachman mentions that Ivan is also probably a kind of double for the I. This was in, again in her various interviews. And Lennox reads that Ivan actually resides in the female psyche. He represents the tyranny of romantic love of compulsory heterosexuality, whose laws women accept and interiorize. How then do we regard, we go to another character in the book, Lena, also Malina, but Lena, no? Who is also the voiceless Rita in the father's house, as opposed to the opinionated and assertive Lena in Ungagasa? Is she too another extension of the eye? When the narrator in the text wants to, in the novel, wants to rearrange her apartment and suggests she get two men to help, Lena dismisses the suggestion contemptuously and says, We don't need men for that. The eye says, Lena and I are dependent on each other in an inescapable way. We are closely connected, although she doesn't give in to herself or me concerning the men with the beer. Although only she is allowed to criticize me out loud and not vice versa. But I do criticize her in secret. Then there's the figure of Lily, whom she writes letters to in the first chapter, seeking help and signing herself as an unknown woman. And she writes, once again, it's my birthday. Pardon me, it's your birthday. And in another letter later on in the text, she says, I notice something in me is letting go of you, no longer courting you, not even looking for you anymore. Of course, hair gay or hair, no, hair G or hair, hair W, or as far as I'm concerned, hair A, might have tried to separate us in some vile manner. But how can two people be split by one or more third parties? Where no wish for separation exists, it cannot occur. Thus, it can only have been your deep-seated desire lying in wait for the slightest occasion. For me, no occasion would have ever risen, arisen, and therefore today there can't be any either. You have merely regressed inside of me. You have passed into the time in which we once together, and there stands your youthful likeness, no longer vulnerable to the damage of later events and in my opinions of them. It may no longer be spoiled. It is standing in the mausoleum within me, next to the image of invented characters, figures soon revived, soon dying. And further in chapter two, the third man, she talks about her parents. Now my father has my mother's face as well. And I don't know exactly when he is my father and when he is my mother. Then the suspicion intensifies and then I know he's not either one, but some third thing. Scholars have tried to decipher the various meanings of the word Malina. Uh, Shruti just told us about it. It is a common name for a girl. It means raspberry in Slavic languages. Alexander Kuman recently decodes it as a secret hiding place. Kuman's interpretation by offering a new connotation to the word augments what both Ingeborg Bachmann and Bachmann scholars have already talked about. Bachmann in the novel creates the cemetery of murdered daughters standing by which the eye weeps bitterly. And in the images of the bookshelves being destroyed by a father's henchman, conjuring images of the book burning of 1933, as also an, in the image of the father resting the great golden gem laden uh, 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 the, the, this thing of, of, the, of the University of Vienna, specter of the University of Vienna from the narrator. Her response to this is defiance. And she says to her father, to God, I will live, you know, the same way as a secret hiding place. Kuman says that a Madina denotes the secret hiding places in which Ashkenazi Jews sought to evade transportation by Nazi authorities during World War II. By inserting Malina as the title of the novel, it becomes a private code that enables Bachmann to articulate the unspeakable 
through what she calls a furative poetics of secrecy. Marlena may be read, according to Kuman, as a metaphor for the secret concealment of female expression as a response to the threat of annihilation. So um, the eyes, I will live. Bachman suggests that like the original occupants of these hiding spaces, the female subject must suffer the erasure of every trace of her selfhood in exchange for her life. As unseen and unheard, unwritten and unspoken, ich necessarily ceases to be. In recognizing that she mir mirrors her peripheral hiding place, we come to understand why Ich insists that she never really exists at all. The code word Malina remains hidden in post-war Vienna for the reason that it ought to have been obsolete in a time of peace, which obviously we know doesn't happen. And to my mind, this reading is interesting, but I don't know to what extent it furthers Bachmann uh, research. It's really interesting that she finds this through her, uh, through her uh, investigations, as it were. Who or what is Marlena? Towards the end of the third chapter, Marlena says to the Ich, I often sat in the dark. Back then, you were the light. By this time, Marlena has become aggressive towards the I, has become dominant. The Ich is estranged from itself, exists only in an object position, is not the subject of her story, Hence, a story that can exist only in a today or in dreams. The mirror scene where she tries on a new dress and puts on makeup and looks at herself draws one's attention to her objectification of herself, looking at herself as only, only as others regard her. Christa Wolf, in her Frankfurt lecture, said, I maintain that every woman who in this century and in our cultural sphere has ventured into institutions shaped by the male self image literature, aesthetics are such institutions, has had to come to know the desire for self-destruction. In her novel, Marlena, Ingeborg Bachmann, has the woman disappear in the wall at the end and the man, Marlena, who is a piece of her, calmly expresses what is the case. There is no woman here. It was murder, the last sentence says. It was also suicide. Now, that is an intervention by... Uh, Ingeborg, uh, by Krista Wolf, and this was when she was doing her Cassandra um, talks, as, I mean, her Frankfurt talks, which went into a Cassandra book. There have been major disagreements with this reading of Malina. Many, many do not concede that it cost, could possibly be suicide. Because then, if it was suicide, she acted, but actually she was acted upon. So how can it be suicide? But I believe that even in the film, many people interpret it like this, including the actress, Isabella Hubert. Wolf further states that her Frank, in her Frankfurt lectures, that Bachmann's Todes Arten could not be pressed into conventional male aesthetic forms because they, unlike, say, Flaubert's Madame Bovary, derived their different morphology from Bachmann's female experience. Bachmann, however, is that nameless woman from Malina. She is that Franza from the novel fragment who simply can't get a grip on her story, can't give it a form. She simply cannot manage to make a presentable story out of her experience to present it in an artistic form. Now, this argument again puts her in an outsider position. And of course, one can debate this argument later. Every attempt to interpret Marlena always falls short. Be the focus on the destruction of women's subjectivity, the reading of the I as woman as victim, the disappearance of the personhood of woman, or women beat and developing of a new way of writing, a new aesthetics, the critique of the dominant order through language, or as Sarah Lennox portrays it, says, a portrait of deformations of private life. Mm -hmm. How does one read this novel, except just read it and let it seep into you? How is the novel structured? What role do the usual narrative structures of time, place, plot, character have here? Is there even a plot? Ingeborg Bachmann in her Frankfurt lecture states that the first change that the eye has experienced is that it no longer resides in history, but that history now resides in the eye. That means only as long as I itself remains unquestioned, as long as one trusted it to be able to tell its story, history was also guaranteed by it. The eye of Malina acts almost exclusively within the private realm. Bachmann remarks that as she wrote Malina, she had the feeling that I am writing against something, against a persistent terrorism. After all, people don't really die from illnesses. 
they die from what's been done to them. In, a no in the novel, we repeatedly see the acute physical manifestation that the narrator experiences in moments of distress. A, her pathological agitation when, the, when she hears the word today, or when she arrives back in the third district where her country is, the Ungagasa land, her blood pressure begins to rise. And at the same time, the tension begins to fall. The cramps which attack me in unknown places abate. And although I keep walking faster and faster, I finally attain a happy, almost urgent tranquility. And in the final chapter of the book, she absorbs words in her body first. Dangerous impulses of great consequences are often felt first in the body where they cause certain words to be pronounced. Uh, the narrator of the story is herself a writer. In fact, she's writing a book in which too she's writing a death cycle. And her reflections on the construction of a story are given, are there in that sense also kind of metafiction. So yeah, I'd like to share a um, little aside, a little story by Margaret Atwood. So a little digression here. And it's not moving. Yeah. The short story is called Happy Endings. And it's really very tiny which starts with the following text written in italics and placed in the middle of the page. John and Mary met. What happens next? If you want happy endings, try A. Atwood then proceeds to give the reader choices from A to F with A as the fairy tale version of life. And the reader can choose whichever story they would like to read. Other characters appear in these, James, Fred, Ma Mage. In fact, the storyline is then no longer about John and Mary, but about Fred and Mage or Fred and Mary. So names are, inter are interchangeable. The last story reads like this. If you think this is all too bourgeois, make John a revolutionary and Mary a counter espionage agent and see how far that gets you. Remember, this is Canada. You'll still end up with A, though in between you may get a lustful brawling saga of passionate involvement, a chronicle of our times, sort of. These multiple story lines end with what she calls the only authentic ending, John and Mary die, repeated thrice. After this rather sardonic inventory of possible storylines, Atwood tells us that beginnings are much more fun and that true connoisseurs, however, are known to favor the stretch in between since it's the hardest to do anything with. That's all about all that can be said for plots, which anyway are just one thing after another. A what and a what and a what now try how and why. And of course, the only authentic ending is John and Mary die, John and Mary die, John and Mary die, and the eye goes into the wall. What Atwood is putting out for us, out there for us, is the exception, expectation that plots actually are coherent and there is closure at the end. But then this is what fiction is supposedly doing. Why a character reacts in a certain way? Would another have reacted differently in that situation? Why do we have minor characters in the story? Who are they? What does the reader do with them? Are they just some of the, are just some of the many questions that come in the how and why, and also in the where? Why does this take place in this particular place? And Shruti just told us about the wonderful painting, which was not of Vienna, but has such a deep Viennese connection, you know, so they're always linkages and they're always real reasons why things are placed. And she talked, in fact, Ingeborg Bachmann talks about names as well in her Frankfurt um, lectures. Uh, another why is about closure at the end of the story. Readers often desire resolution at the end of a film or a novel. We just have to look at what has been done with Grimm's fairy tales when they were retold by Disney. Atwood gives us the only possible ending, just as Bachman does. It was murder, which leaves the reader with more questions. In Marlena, the eye disappears into the crack of the, or in the wall, the only resolution for the female eye, which since the novel was published has led to multiple interpretations. Did she kill herself, including the one that I mentioned earlier, with Krista Wolf. Did she kill herself? Was she murdered? Why did the eye kill the female half and allow the male alter ego to survive? Why does the narrator mislead the reader about Marlena, who's both visible as a real person in the text, 
and invisible because he and Ivan never meet, although he lives with I. Now, I would like to refer here to the blurb that Karen Achtenberger, Acht, Achtenberger translated in her volume, Understanding Bachmann from 1985. That was the first English translation of it, which does not appear in any edition of the novel. We do find it in that critical edition of the Ways of Dying project edited by Pichel and Albrecht and Goetzsche. And it appears in the drafts for the cover text. As Achberger points out, the debate around whether I committed suicide or was murdered is taken care of when we take this text into account. Bachmann saw the disappearance of the I as a criminal act, as murder. If the I committed suicide, she made a choice, but if she was murdered, she was acted upon. Murder or suicide? There are no witnesses. A woman between two men, a last great passion, the wall in the room with an, an imperceptible, imperceptible crack, a corpse that is not found, the last will and testament missing, a pair of glasses broken to bits, a missing coffee cup, the waste paper basket unnoticed, not searched through by anyone, covered tracks, footsteps, someone then who still paces back and forth in this apartment for hours on end, Marlena. In the first section of the book, the first section of the book introduces the reader to the dramatist persona. Let's go to the next one. Let's talk a little bit of the structure of the novel. Uh, in this section, the eye tells us about her relationship with time and place, whereas the first frightens her, the today is frightening. The place, her Ungergassen land in the third district of Vienna is not frightening. The spaces around them can be easily uh, can be easily named. It is familiar. A long list of place names which also give the reader a swift through tour through one section of Vienna follows. And she says here, uh, the information, this is again from an interview of hers, information about the person is always that what is the least what has the least to do with that person. The ungarns or pezons and imadas, person the pezon and venixon sutun hut, no? Um, in the first chapter of book of the book, Glücklich mit Ivan, Happy with Ivan, uh, Bachmann says that she has a suspicion that he too, Ivan too, is a do doppel figure. I had already said this. We learn in this chapter, we learn of her relationship with the Hungarian Ivan and his two children. Ivan makes it clear to her that he can never love her, but she lives in Ivan, as she says in the novel. They have their fatigue sentences, swearing sentences, and head sentences. They converse on the telephone, that is to say she speaks and there is silence on the other end. They play chess. It is in this chapter that the mythical tale of the princess of Kagran is introduced as a possibility of another way of living and being. A day will come when people shall have red golden eyes and serial voices, when their hands will be gifted for love, and the poetry of their lineage shall be recreated and their hands will be gifted for goodness. With their innocent hands, they will reach for the highest goodness. They shall not forever, mankind shall not forever. They will not have to wait forever. This novel does have the conventional trappings, descriptions of society, life, holidays with the children, etc. But beyond that, there is the telling of this or that or the impossibility of telling of this because the I can express herself only through Malina, her male alter ego. In this chapter, there is also a wonderfully satirical portrayal of Viennese high society. When the I is invited to Wolfgang Zee by the Gebauers, and she goes there only because she cannot go to Monze with Ivan and his children. A little bit more difficult to interpret are the realist scenes with the children whose mother we know nothing of. In the second chapter, the Drittaman, the third man, the dream chapter. This third man clearly references the Carol Reed Orson Welles film from 1949 about the black market in post-war Austria. It is a chapter of nightmares in which the daughter repeatedly dies at the hands of the father. He is referred to as Sire, he is God, who imprisons her in a gas chamber. He turns her into an ice statue. He becomes a crocodile in the Danube. All the crocodiles from the Nile have come to the Danube. Her father has sworn to kill her. 
She has a child born of incest whom she named Animus and who is shot to death by her father's jealous pride. This chapter also chronicles the daughter's repeated attempts at resistance. They are, however, ineffectual. Both mother and she, both her mother and she are guilty through their complicity and silence. This is an incredibly brutal chapter and the only relief offered here are the few conversations that the narrator has with Malina, who tells her there is no war and peace. And she finally realizes that there is only war, everlasting war. In the final chapter of the book, Last Things, the narrator is stumbling around from one topic to another. Ivan, Ivan is pulling away. Marina is changing towards her. She says, I need my double existence, my Ivan life and my Marina life. But I have lived in Ivan and I die in Marina. Her wardrobe is empty except for two dresses, one which Marina gave her and one which she had worn the first time Ivan saw her. She puts on the dress Marlene, Marlena gave her. It is itchy. It is her Nessus shirt, poisonous shirt, which she never wanted to wear, the poison shirt. A crack in the wall appears and she eventually disappears into it. Only Marlena remains answering a telephone call, most probably from Ivan. Und ich bin, um, und ich bin ganz sicher, dass in den Träumen alles drin steht, was an Furchtbarkeit in dieser Zeit geschieht und dass alle ermordet werden. Again, another interview. I'm convinced that in the dreams, everything is there, what is terrible in this time, and that all are murdered. This was, of course, the last chapter, sorry. And she says, Bachmann says, the ending is written like a score, you know, winding down. Now, I'd just like to go to a few images about how the text actually looks visually. Because um, what happened? I missed. No, I didn't. I'm sorry. I had to rush through the whole thing again. Okay. So there are one-sided telephone conversations with Ivan, sentence fragments, reference to musical works, legends are written in italics, conversations happen with Malina, which again have a different form. The letters to the president, again, a different form to Lily, to Herr Richter. There's multiple forms and genres existing in this novel. And this is a telephone conversation. I'm not going to, of course, read it out. But what is also interesting is how Ingeborg Bachmann makes use of a variety of many languages in the text, French, Italian, Hungarian. They all sort of come here in the text. And obviously in the translation, they were not translated. And here, this conversation, this one-sided conversation on one side of the page. Then the mystery is the princess of Kagan, written everywhere in italics, breaking the text continuously. This apparently hopeful text, but also an incredibly depressing text. Um, and then how she has conversations with Malina. So there's a big difference between the telephone conversations with Ivan and the dialogic kind of conversations she has with Malina. And here we can see this insertion of musical, I don't know what you call these things, but what is used in music. Più, mosso, forte, molto meno mosso, tempo giusto, etc., etc. You know, andante con grazia, how you should be speaking, you know, in a very dramatic manner, as it were. Then you have the letters, always from an unknown woman. She will never, ever want to reveal who she is. She has to be unknown continuously, you know? Um, spaces and critical positions in this text. The Austrian Military Museum in the Arsenal, Franz Josef Sky, Café Landmann, Hoimark, Stadtpark, Central Customs Office, Neuling Gasse, Consulato Italiano, Instituto Italiano di Cultura, Unger Gasse, Renweg, Beatrix Gasse, Schwarzenberg Platz, Belvedere, Vienna Intercontinental Hotel, Stadtpark, Vienna Woods, Kahlenberg, Invadibenstraße, Freyung, Graben, Dobkowitz Platz, Heumarkt. 
And this is all in the very first introduction where she's introducing her characters. She's walking back and she's thinking about some of these places and she's walking through some of these places. This is about Vienna, about the house Austria, and it's not about the country Austria. In any case, the country that I belongs to is the Ungargassen land. Austria's imperial past is very much a part of the novel as also post-war Vienna. And, and this Shruti is also mentioned, the Maria Hilferstrasse and the incredible consumerism of this time. The novel takes place in the socio-geographical space of Vienna in the 60s. Bachmann writes this novel in Rome in her first born land and not in Vienna, the city which is presented so intricately in this novel. Andrea Stoll writes that Bachmann in her later years had a love-hate hate relationship with Vienna. Um, she was supposedly coming back to Vienna in 1973 when she dies. The centrality of Vienna for Bachmann's development as a writer has been repeatedly emphasized by scholars and critics and her contemporaries and finds its expression in her Todes Arten project, especially in her novel Malina, with this transfer of Vienna's third district into the mythical realm of the Unga Gassen land. So um, both spaces of hope for her, also the space where she dies ultimately. As Karen Achberger points out, Malina should not be misread as a psychologicalizing and depoliticizing novel. It was not a retreat from the political sphere to the private. It was an attempt to expose what she perceived as a primary source of political oppression. Fascism is the first thing in the relationship between a man and a woman. This is what Bachmann said in an interview. Bachmann herself dismissed all apolitical readings of her book. And she says in one of her interviews, if, for example, I say nothing in this book, Marlena, about the Vietnam War, nothing about so and so many catastrophic conditions of our society, then I know how to say it in a different way, or I hope that I know how to say it. What Bachmann's texts quite deliberately portray, one might maintain, is the kind of consciousness that made Vietnam possible, according to Lennox. Bachmann believes that it cannot be the job of the writer to use phrases like democracy, socialism, capitalism. They have to be able to represent them. Austria, according to Bachmann, no longer actively participates in world history. Austria has dropped out of history. For me, this was a handicap at first. I felt disadvantaged, like a disinherited person coming from a province that no longer has anything to do or decide. Today, however, I see myself at an advantage. One can see phenomena much more clearly from the small, decayed country. Because there's so many readings to this novel, one can only focus on a few aspects. So I shall be looking very briefly at how the narrator relates to spaces she is in, which actually will then read Malina more as a socio-critical novel. Topography is central in the narration of the eye. The Stadtpark was a scene of universal prostitution. The Gebauer House or the house of the Altenwills is a, Wiles is a site of destruction. Malina works at the War Museum. Ivan is Hungarian, so there's always that border story. The history of Vienna is a space where the murderous intentions are carried out. And society, the Viennese society, is the biggest murder scene of all. The narrator herself relates to the house Österreich and not Austria, to the multicultural Habsburg Austria, not to the Austria created in the early 20th century. Sarah Lennox, Hans Höller, Holger Gehler, amongst others, have remarked on the on uh, Ingeborg Bachmann's criticism of the social order, and one cannot restrict one's understanding of the novel as questioning the dominant order merely through the lens of patriarchy, which has led to the fascistic relationship between men and women and between people. Men aren't normal, the uh, narrator says. That's not all. In Vienna, however, it could have been different. It must not be that bad, since the city is made for universal prostitution. You probably can't remember the first years after the war. Vienna was, to put it mildly, a city equipped with the strangest institutions, but this time has been expunged from the city's annals. No one talks about it anymore. 
I would like to refer here to a delightful text written much earlier in which the I and Malina also appear and verse which first appeared in, 19, in the 1971 edition of Text and Critique and it's called Besichtigung einer Stadt, einer alten Stadt, sightseeing in an ancient city. This text really puts Vienna and veniality and banality and the banality of the 60s into perspective, the 50s and the 60s really into perspective. It is usually read as an independent story and the story takes us through a tour of Vienna in an Austrobus with a group of American tourists. Mr. and Mrs. Malina join this tour, speak in English and travel through the day and night, through day and the day and the night in this bus, going to all the touristy spots in Vienna. She says, because Marlena and I want to see Vienna, the Vienna we have never seen before, we take a trip with the Austro bus. The tour guide has a Beethoven mask around his neck. This incredible text satirizes the tourist industry of Vienna and the tourist spaces of Vienna. Vienna has the most famous water in the world. And they visit the various fountains and drink water from them. They don't stop at the Karlskirche, the National Library. There's plenty of historical bloopers. And they finally stop at the Patisserie in the inter inner city, where to the astonishment of the I and Malina, the Americans have five minutes to buy the most famous Austrian chocolates named after the most famous composer of all times. And so it goes on. The most famous museum, which is after, in fact, the university. The breathlessness of the tour guide who is spouting nonsensical facts as is often the case. Trip, which as it turns out, neither is willing to accept as an idea stemming from them. They return to the safe, safety of the Unga Gasa, weary from this day and night tour of Vienna. And in the text, the eye says, the guide has clearly already taken all kinds of foreigners through Vienna, Brazilians, Pakistanis, Japanese, Otherwise, he could not have allowed himself these audacious deviations and stop at the strangest places. We rush past the state opera, where are happening the greatest singing successes and singing accidents in the world. And even more hurriedly, we rush past the Burg Theatre, where are happening every evening the oldest and the most famous dramas and murderings in Europe. I'm sorry, but I couldn't resist this text. It was just too wonderful. So uh, I skipped one and I want to come back to that slide. I'm sorry, I missed it. Ingeborg Bachmann was asked, uh, if you had the chance, what would you like to change in this Dasein's forms, in the structures of this, of our society? And she says, a day will come when people will have black golden eyes. They will see beauty. They will be freed from dirt and from every burden. They will rise into the sky. They will dive into the waters. They will forget their calluses and hardships. A day will come when they will be free. All people will be free, even from the freedom they had presumed. There shall be a greater freedom beyond measure, a freedom to last a whole life long. In the novel, there's this constant refrain a day will come. Bachman responds to that in an interview and says, I really believe in something and I call it a day will come. It won't come and I believe in it anyway. For if I can't still believe in it, I can't write anymore. I would like to say that there are two things that should have been brought into this discussion, which I've left out completely. One is music, the role of music in this uh, novel. Um, that was because I would require some tutoring to get the nuances of that, how it is interwoven into the novel. And I've left out the books, the knowledge spaces that the narrator owns, as it were, in the text. But I thought that would just go on for far too long. So I would like to now end, if that's okay. Thank you so much for listening and for your patience. Oh, thank you so much, Madhu. That was really very interesting, very clear. Um, you started with the reception of uh, Ingeborg Bachmann in, in the more recent times. We then went on to uh, have a closer look at um, the text itself, the structure, 
and uh, of course you know vienna your title uh, suggested uh, your title said malina a viennese novel so we, I, I kept thinking okay fine i mean vienna we're going to talk about vienna but i totally forget about i forgot about the novel mm -hmm. which you covered today as mm -hmm. well uh, which was also very important because um, it was indeed very important to look into uh, the structure of uh, the entire um, text uh, especially because there is no structure. Um, you did look at, I mean, in, in the sense you said, well, every, everyone dies in the end, any which way. And whether there is a handlung, a proper handlung, is there a, a certain movement? Uh, we cannot talk about a Bildungsroman in this case. We are just looking at, um, at moments. Um, there are, um, psych I mean, well, you said w one should not uh, personalize it. It's more a political, but there is also very important underlying psychic, psychological um, uh, underpinnings to the entire text. There are very important things there. Um, the talk about um, anima, for example, animus. I remember way back I had written the text and I had mentioned, you know, I had I mentioned Carl Gustav Jung in my interpretation. And then you had asked, is this, have you written it yourself? And uh, I said, yes, but I don't really understand it completely. <laughs> Today, I do understand it a little bit more. Uh, but uh, the fact that, and that actually also kind of, you know, um, but very interesting because uh, what I did not see while uh, reading and while we were reading it together, we kept focusing on either Ivan or Malina. But today you also showed us that it is not just that, that the, the eye is further fractured. The fragments of the eye actually extend into the other female figures of the novels as well. And that is so interesting. So I remember now and you spoke about Lena, you spoke about Lily. There is obviously Frau Jelinek herself. So th that intertextual allusion there to the actual Jelinek perhaps. Of course, this Jelinek is with a double L, I don't know. Uh, and she's just a receptionist, I think, a stenographer there. Yes, um, yes. And it was long back. I do not know whether Jelinek was on the scene at that time. Is ah, all right. <laughs> right. Okay. So Sorry. Just um, maybe a chance then, what what a chance, uh, serendipity. Uh, and then we have, of course, this um, the beginning when uh, she talks about Malina, she also says Maria Malina. And that's very interesting because, uh, you know, in English, of course, we can also talk about, and I, I think I read in one of the texts there where Malina, if restructured and reshuffled, actually comes to animal. So very interesting. So, but that, that happens only in English, and otherwise we have only the anima there, you know. So the anima actually stays, and um, so the the conscious, the other. Uh, of course, when when Jung talks about it, he says that the, that every male has got a female consciousness that is suppressed, perhaps, and uh, but there is the other self to the male that is the anima whereas uh, uh, every male has got an uh, uh, every female has got an animus here you also mentioned that the child is called animus which is then killed by the father in the dream very complex and i find that very fascinating of course you also spoke about the spaces which was very important and you also talked about the kind of consumerism that had seeped into um, the Viennese society, which uh, Ingeborg, was, Ingeborg Bachmann was also criticizing at this point in time. Uh, a social critical novel, right? That's what he said. That's how you look at the, um, that's how you want to see the, 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 work, the work of um, uh, Ingeborg Bachmann. Uh, which I totally agree with, yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, it, it's somehow when when we started reading, and uh, Ashwat and Vaishnavi when they started reading, they just the first reaction was, and and they had read and they were about to uh, do the presentation. They said, "Why did we read the text? What was it all about?" So now I want to ask Ashwat and Vaishnavi if that would be your reaction even today, and how do you see everything now? Uh, with those remarks, you know, I would like to open the floor for questions and remarks. And maybe if Vaishnavi wants to go first. Yes, Vaishnavi? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the talk. I think we did cover a lot of topics we didn't cover initially for our talk because 
the first time Ashwath and I actually read the text, we were a bit confused, you know, about Malina and its characters. And we were just debating ourselves, like, is it alter ego? If it's alter ego, how does it work in, like, internal, external spaces? Is the author trying to create Evar as an external consciousness in society and, like, Malina as, like, an internal consciousness? Is that how it's working? We had a great discussion about that and it was great to hear your views as well. I just ha had another question. So in chapter two, we read a lot about how memory is playing a major role for the author, right? So I just want to know, like, how does the memory shape the character's perception about themselves? Like, how does it, how does that evolve? And how does that later transform in the power dynamics that are playing between the I, Malina and Evan? But memory, uh, in the second chapter specifically, you would like to talk about it? Yes. So that's the dream chapter, right? Yes, Professor. So where her memory is actually the suppressed memories, right? That come out in the dreams of being murdered, constantly being murdered over and over again in the society. So according to you, where does Ivan come into this? Uh, Ivan, is, he also, is he also a part of the murdering? Well, that is the part of the question, like, is because for me, Ivan, as you said, could also be an altered ego, which was created, like a maybe a secondary ego created, right? Yeah. So if, she said that herself, yeah. Yeah. So in that case, how is like, how is transforming her own perception, like when she's creating these egos for herself, there might be a sense of uh, self that she's portraying to the other egos, right? Like, uh, her perception about herself or the perception she would like to have about herself. Uh, so I just want to know if that comes into being at all when she creates these characters for herself. Oh, goodness. I don't know because from what you're talking about, it's like multiple personalities, but I don't think this is about multiple personalities per se. You know, it is about a person who cannot articulate her personality in that sense, who is not allowed to, she can articulate who is not being allowed to. And what are her memories? Her memories of Vienna, her, even a memory, her, her being in the Ungagasa, which is this land, which is her country, where is the only place where she feels safe. Why does she want to move out of this place to go to another district, to Heiligenstadt? Why does she want to move out from here? What has happened in this space that doesn't allow her to stay here anymore? And Malina doesn't want to go. So that part of her doesn't want to go. But the I part of her, the one that will eventually be killed, wants to go. So she wants to leave these memories behind too, isn't it? I don't know. I'm not being very clear, I think. I don't know really because what you are asking me is too um, wide for me to be able to comprehend, to honestly. In, a, in, in anything but a rambling manner, you know? Maybe you should think of it yourselves again. Yeah, so while Vaishnavi thinks a little bit, uh, well, uh, do we have other questions in the chat perhaps or any hands raised? Ashwat, do you want to go next? Yeah, uh, yeah. Yes, Professor. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, picking back on uh, Dr. Jain's point, which he brought during her introductory uh, talk, about how towards the end we find out that you know Ish is killing herself and not Malina, you know, like she's allowing for the male dominated part of us herself to take over. And how exactly would you, you know, uh it, this novel is supposed to be a feministic work, but you know, towards the end we see that you know we are succumbing to the male domination. So what exactly would you like to say on that? But why do you want to call it a feminist novel and why do you think all feminist novels have to not accept the fact that they are sometimes forced to succumb. But she's not succumbing and she's not, she's being murdered. You know, I, I don't know, uh, Shruti, maybe you have another take on it. But for me, very clearly, she is murdered. It's not the I who's killing herself. It's the dominant male ego that has killed her. You know, not the female part of her that is... And there is no possibility of this female voice getting a voice. It's a voicelessness, which is so, and that's probably also the reason why I want to see it like not anymore as what is this novel about, about the psyche and all, but really a very, very critical and yes, a feminist novel where she's accepting that there is an issue here. 
like why does she hang around the house wearing a house clyde all the time why does she do that except when she goes out for a walk you know so maybe i don't know maybe you are right why does she allow herself to be killed otherwise there would be no story no so that was also uh, you know the discussion the point of discussion where we said well is, is it really murder or is it the eye that actually succumbs mm -hmm. um to her male ego let's say but that is also relinquishing herself and that's what i also that's how i have formulated it also in my mm -hmm. introductory yeah. notes yeah you know um, so that is precisely the point so, and then even in the beginning itself it is actually known to the eye that she is subordinate to malina she says that right in the beginning right in the first mm -hmm. chapter itself it is very clearly stated that yeah and i know that this is going to happen that he is going yeah. to be my doom so to say yeah so that is actually kind of clear right from the beginning and but how somehow malina is also the only oasis that she has uh, uh, even when she is ill treated by ivan right throughout you know uh, her, the 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 sentences that you said the fragmented sentences the yes sentences the short sentences the broken communication that she has with ivan it is always malina who comes and actually uh, pacifies her that's the only solace that she has somehow there's no other solace and yet he turns against her somehow and she gets alienated as you also said i really love that link because i also kept thinking why this turn around why did malina actually what happened he mm. was supposed to be the good guy yeah mm. and then what happened and uh, this is uh, where did the why did he murder her and it's precisely that alienation that has come in that has um, uh, uh, seeped in mm. uh, that actually has then turned into the third chapter and that's why that's where we see the, the kind of distancing between the two and that happens there And so I, it's very it's a fine line between committing suicide and um, being murdered in this sense, in this particular sense, especially because the difference between Malina and herself, she herself acknowledges, is hardly there. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's why I think it kind of goes in that direction. And one could, so therefore, the discussion, yeah, and the dress, the dress she gets, the course, poison absolutely. dress, yeah. Yes, she and calls. She says, "I don't have anything else to wear." In the end, and she takes. He, she borrows the dress from him. Uh, why does she borrow it from him? So that's the only dress hanging, and the other dress that's hanging is the one that she wore, and right. they have stripes on the opposite side. No, I mean right. stripes at the bottom and the stripes. So I live in uh, Ivan and I die in. Malina. I die in Malina. Right. Yeah, sense, and right. while she's living, that's also interesting. She's hardly living. She's not happy with Ivan. Uh, so this kind of um, self afflicted um uh, there's a lot of self afflictions here one can see that right throughout she is not uh, she is totally unhappy but finally in the end yes she does overcome ivan at least that that's what we can say because that's where malina yeah. comes in and he says well no there is no woman sorry you know so it's basically you know uh, i i read it somewhere that ingeborg bachmann used to always call herself a honorary an honorary man um in fact elfrida yelinek also it's a very very i mean known quote by her where she says ich bin eine frau mit einer männlichen anmaßung mm. um so you have to be the man you know man muss seinen mann or man also die frau muss ihren mann stehen <laughs> überhaupt <laughs> um yeah zu, zu leben mm. so uh, I, i find that very interesting but arti has raised her hand arti please uh hi everybody hello madhu hi arti hi i uh, again uh, we had the whole course about ingeborg bachmann with you and i remember <laughs> reading malena and still i'm perturbed <laughs> when it all comes to me like i'm still like it's puzzling and i'm perturbed but i was just thinking like you we are talking about and like as you talk about malina and then ish and then then like different identities uh, how i am receiving it at the moment it feels like to me 
that Ivan probably, maybe uh, we can um, discuss about it. Ivan seems to be a different person, whereas Malina and Ish, they are one. And maybe we can, uh, I see it like Malina is the articulate uh, self of Ish, which could be the, um, how do, we, how do we see it? As a masculine side of a person, but predominantly I see Ish as a woman. And Malina is the masculine side of her, which acts, which articulates. And, but when uh, Malina is disappear disappearing in the, uh, in the wall, maybe the masculine side of the eye is getting silent. And then you say that she is going to live in Ivan. So is it something like she is um, now surrender surrendering to Ivan? That is one thing. And um, so it shows the vulnerable side of this character ish, which is not just one, but more than one. Like uh, uh, could be, it constitutes more than one kind of um, it had more than one layers or more than one gender. I could also say that. That is one thing. And second thing you talked about, I found it very interesting that she is in conversation with Ivan over the phone and the conversation is fragmented and it's never like a dialogue. But then she, you uh, uh, shared another text where she is speaking to Malina and there is a dialogue. You mentioned the word dialogue. So she is in dialogue with Malina, whereas with Ivan, she can only speak in fragment. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to uh, also ask, you mentioned that it is kind of a spiritual autobiography. Mm -hmm. So is there, a, what, what, what does it mean like being spiritual autobiography? Uh, like, Okay, um, so, book, spiritual imaginary autobiography because there are no dates, no names, no nothing. Yeah, okay. but uh, much like a lot of other writers do, it is actually also a largely about Ingeborg Bachmann, the book. No, but it is not about Ingeborg Bachmann at the same time. You know, and this is, I think, the dilemma when we read almost all the texts, which are so intense as Malina is. You know, so I do not know necessarily whether we should call it spiritual. That was, I've been trying to hunt out what people meant because people have translated that uh, separately you know, in a guy sticker. So it could be the intellectual or the spiritual. It's up to you how you want to interpret it. Yeah, we could say it's intellectual. It's an intellectual imaginary autobiography. Uh, if you don't want to use the word spiritual. Yeah. Okay. I should have slashed it. Huh? Yeah, it's very interesting. So can mm. we say that it is uh, related to something again, like you don't see women as somebody who can uh, connect to the intellect. So Malina is, again, I derive to the same conclusion that Malina mm. is the main side of her, mm. this person, mm. and she intellectually connects to it. Yeah. Yeah, that comes up quite clearly even in some of Ingeborg Bachmann's own interviews. And as you probably noticed, I really work more with interviews rather than anything else. What Ingeborg Bachmann had to say about Malina, you know, uh, because I found that quite fascinating beyond the way it's been, Malina has been interpreted by so many. Because when you read Ingeborg Bachmann about her novel, she has a very different take on what she was trying to do. And as at, at some point, she also tells somebody, if you think this is not a political novel. You've not understood what I'm trying to do. In one interview, she even says this. And maybe that's why I try to distance myself. I know it's a sushogram. It's all these kind of things. But there's so much more in this novel, you know, to my mind. And when she disappears into the crack, into the wall, I mean, one part of her splits, she splits essentially. You know, she's no longer the Twitter figure. She's no longer, she just splits and she goes away. But she doesn't go away. She's kills, she is killed by the male, the dominant 
creature, at, at the dominant part of her rather than, uh, at least that's what I think. But everything in my opinion is just thinking. Hmm? Just one thing, Shruti, I would like to mention because this we I didn't do it in the text and I, I find that bit really totally fascinating is the relationship that I has to the children, not only to Animus, but also to the two boys of um, Ivan. Because that's what makes actually Ivan belong to an, even belong to another world because he has children. Okay, the, the mother is nowhere on si in sight. Yeah, we don't know. She's again, typically nameless. Yeah. But the two children are there and they're mostly badly behaved children and she tries to get along with them. So what is this part of her that is trying to get along with them? So I didn't explore that too much, but I, I'm sorry, Shruti, you wanted to say something. Yeah, of course, uh, Anu has also raised her hand, but I'd like to just respond to Arti's uh, point of uh, spiritual imaginary autobiography. Uh, one question maybe, uh, uh, I mean, at places, uh, I've also come across um, uh, experts and, and scholars saying that there are references to Paul Ceylan, for example, Malina yeah. uh, has then also uh, certain um, bits and pieces. We already know what kind of a tormented love affair they had. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a, 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 a very passionate love affair uh, and they did get along each, very well with each other and yet uh, they parted ways mm -hmm. um, and, and, and then came back again together, you know. So the very brief um, uh, moments where they were together, two months and very, very short time. But there are... Um, places in the text where she then also has, you know, put in a lot of Paul Ceylan in building the yeah. character of Malina. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, uh, and my question would be if, if the ich dies, you know, what, and, and that's what I was thinking. And I think you already um, got the hint of it. What is it about the woman? You know, if the man lives and the woman has died in her, yeah. Uh, then what is it? Um, what is the idea of a woman that Ingeborg Bachmann is trying to portray? What does she understand under being a woman? And that comes back to my question. Is she, does she have a definition? Have you come across any definition that Ingeborg Bachmann would give of a woman, of being a woman? I'll hunt for some more interviews. <laughs> uh, Anu, Anu, please. Thank you, Shruti. Thank you, Madhu, so much. I will uh, take up with where Aarti left off because I was in the same batch <laughs> where we had a semester of Ingeborg Bachmann in which we also read uh, Malina. And uh, from all those years ago, there are uh, you know two texts that have stayed with me in particular. One is, of course, Malina and the other one was the Thai Sixth Yar, which I think, again, when we read, we were we, the students, were in our early 20s. Mm -hmm. um, and certain things, I mean, we understood the text, mm -hmm. understood it as a text, you know. Um, but it's only, I think, by the time, like, a decade later <laughs> that I sort of had the urge to read it again. Mm -hmm. And I had the feeling that mm -hmm. uh, rereading at this stage would be more uh, fruitful. And it was indeed. Mm -hmm. um, and I imagine that if I keep coming back to the text every decade or every five or eight years, I will probably react to it differently also. Absolutely. Um, so there's that. And um, Malina is, of course, a very powerful text. Mm. I would say one of the most powerful that I read mm. from amongst German literature, but generally from literature anywhere in the world. And uh, like Aarti, I am also still perturbed. <laughs> but really perturbed because it is such a brutal text also. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you about your experience of teaching this text in class, because sometime after I started teaching in Hyderabad, which was a good 13 years ago, I think in my second year there or my third year there, I thought, let me try this mm -hmm. with our MA literature course. Mm -hmm. And it was... Um, the text is also it's really dense and because there's no handlung in that sense it's mm -hmm. also difficult for people who are also still struggling with the language and stuff to kind of get into it mm -hmm. um you know and i think people tend to be always looking for a handlung for things to happen for mm -hmm. actions to take place mm -hmm. and that doesn't really happen 
So that was one issue, but that's not the only text which has this. So that was not the main thing. The main thing was that it was a group of three, two gentlemen and one lady. Mm -hmm. um, I was very new at this mm -hmm. and maybe I didn't do this correctly, mm -hmm. but the two gentlemen seemed completely unconvinced mm -hmm. and not quite they couldn't figure out why we were reading the text. It was at that level. And the girl at some point broke down in tears and sobbed and sobbed and could not stop. Mm -hmm. And that kind of uh, <laughs> dissuaded me mm -hmm. from picking it up again, which I think is a big pity because it's a text worthy of being read by mm -hmm. everyone. And I think it brings in also... I mean, it changes people's expectations of a novel, for mm -hmm. one thing, which is already a worthy enough goal. Mm -hmm. But it brings in a gender discourse, which uh, everybody needs to get into and have that conversation. But I just found that it affected the girl so strongly, understandably, but really she broke down and she sobbed for very long. Mm -hmm. And the other two were completely under reward and uh, I didn't quite know what to make of it. <laughs> and since then, I haven't dared to come back to it in class. Uh, I find it also personally a perturbing text to read. Mm -hmm. And um, after my time as an MA student, it was very long ago and we read it in class. Mm -hmm. I came back to it once on my own some years later. And then for the third time when I tried to teach the, the text in class and I found myself profoundly disturbed each time mm. and I was in my mid-30s by the time the last experience happened mm. but I honestly didn't know how to make this work in class so that a text that really should be read would be read mm. but without somebody being completely shattered and I was wondering how you deal with this text in class whether you still deal with this text in class and how your experience has been. Well, yes, I still teach it, but Shruti has just recently taught it and she could also share her experiences. And to you, honestly, you guys had forgotten that I'd done this text with you people because it was so <laughs> long back, so long back. And I haven't done Ingeborg Bachmann for a long time in between. But recently I did it again. And I found I couldn't read the second chapter. Hmm. I had a problem. Some students in the class also had a problem. But for most part, I found that young people were identifying with it. Which has led me now to read it as a political novel. Because this too much self-identification with, with the I can be quite dangerous, I thought, you know? So that's why I was sort of rethinking it and I wish I had done a little bit more work with the spaces that I, I, I could have, but it is a Viennese novel, you know? It's, it's, I mean, just keeps taking on tours through Vienna constantly. And I quite understand why she didn't put Besichtigung einer alten Stadt in the novel because it distracts just like the children distract in the novel. You know, you can't relate Glücklich mit Eva in the first chapter with the second chapter. Mm -hmm. You know, they just keep breaking up all three chapters. This third chapter in that sense is the wildest chapter because of the music. You know, how do you deal with that music in it? You know, her the apparently, and this is what I've read. So as I said, I don't understand Western classical music. So I can't tell you why Schoenberg does something and why she's so influenced by Schoenberg and would prefer not to be influenced by X, Y, and Z uh, persons. But the writers, and as you very point, uh, rightly pointed out, Ceylon is there, but Red Star over China is also there in the book. Hmm? At some point, she's reading Red Star over China. I don't know whether for young people today, Red Star over China has any meaning at all. But it was something that one read once upon a time. And it's also there. So as you just said, it's such an incredibly dense text that you really don't know which threads you should pick up. And the minute you fall into this psychological sizing, as it were, it seems as if you can bring it together. 
which to my mind you can't. But the last experience, Anu, was actually quite positive. In fact, I found that I was more disturbed than they were. They were thrilled with the text, which then disturbed me also. Because if I did do this text with you guys, I don't remember any identifications happening. Was it happening that time? No. <laughs> Arti? No. no, but uh, I think we were not shying away from reading the text. No, I don't think you were shying away. Read, read through everything. But uh, it, like the challenge I faced back then, I haven't tried to read Bachman again. But uh, while I was listening to you, I was even more perturbed today. So I'm like, now I should go back and read again. Try reading Malena maybe one more time and see how I do relate to it. But I think this... maybe not to relate. Now I stop trying to relate to something. But how do I read it simply? How do you read it? But yeah. I think another thing you have to factor in, if I may say so, yeah. is that the young people today, and now we are really going into you know the realms of pedagogy. Young people today have so many problems. I don't know how many years ago you read it when this girl burst into tears, something which I can identify with because that is really a horrible, horrible chapter. You know, I couldn't skip it fast enough this time. So it actually made it easier because then I looked for quotes, I went through the English version. So that was quite easy, you know, because it didn't have that, that intensity yeah. that the German had, you know. Yeah, uh, I can understand. I think the young people today, they they have more wider campus than we had. And they have, uh, I guess, they, they are more um, um, exposed to much, uh, many more questions than we did. So that could be the reason why they are more, uh, uh, like they also they, responding for them more. it's more complex. Yeah, I but they're also how responding how more intensely, I feel. Well, we have the young people here who just I read know, the text. Sorry. <laughs> so I'm also wondering, you know, yeah. because that was exactly the reaction that I had perhaps also expected, you know, the day. And I was very happy that they were perturbed and they were confused. Yeah. Uh, the fact that, I mean, that's the function of literature. One of the functions of literature is to perturb. I mean, coming from Nietzsche, I couldn't think otherwise. <laughs> But uh, to perturb and to disturb and to provoke, I think, and that the text does very beautifully. Uh, it, uh, uh, I mean, the, so the, the second thing is obviously it also makes you think why, and that's what Madhu you also beautifully said. The so several whys of the plot, the, the several whys of why this is being done. Um, I think the reader is automatically invited to ponder about it. Um, while teaching this time, you know, I did not force any of the interpretations on to my students. It was they who um, delved into the text themselves and they got and they swam in the ocean and they found jewels. They came up and they handed over to me what they had found. So that, that's how I look at it. You know, it was like that. So beautiful it was, you know, because they actually found quite a lot of things while um, interpreting the text and, and they did it on their own. Uh, their questions and I, I, I remember the day when Ashwat and Vaishnavi couldn't stop talking about the feeling of having read the text. Their text reception was more important than uh, the actual interpretation of the text, you know. How they grappled with the certain aspects, how it was uh, for them, for example. And that was uh, also enough for me for this course, for example. So I was happy with that as well. Uh, they did have solutions to the problems that they identified. Of course, we did not identify everything. Today's text, today's talk was hence a beautiful, um, you know, it gave them an overview. Uh, and also the possibility that we can look at the text in terms of space. What a beautiful way of, uh, actually dealing with this and a very novel way of looking at it because we have been actually looking at many texts, uh, many scholars who've been dealing with the text on this particular individual basis, looking at Ingeborg Bachmann and her life, so autobiographical and what it was like. But I totally agree with the Madhu. I mean, one can look through, especially through the lens of the spatial turn, you know, it is a, it's a brilliant idea to actually look into it. Uh, this way. Jan Helge? 
Uh, yes, I'm here. Uh, I really loved the discussion so far. And uh, if you care to send me that English translation, I will also start teaching it here. Uh, <laughs> because I uh, agree, just uh, picking up on that point, that the uh, relevance of uh, some, I mean, in that sense, it's still relatively contemporary uh, as a novel, but uh, still historical in that it is 50 years ago. Uh, that it still has uh, uh, quite a big relevance in India here. Because, I mean, when I read classical German literature about uh, not being able uh, to marry between, you know, not have a marriage between an aristocrat and a normal citizen, uh, that has particular relevance here still. So anyway, I'll incorporate that. Um, I, I think that... Uh, uh, I want to pick up on another point, actually, in a question, namely, uh, Madhu, you said that, uh, of course, you also mostly focused on interviews uh, from uh, Bar by Bachmann, with Bachmann, uh, in terms of how she uh, sees the novel and what she wants to do. And I kind of have to go back to that uh, uh, first thought that I always have with Ingeborg Bachmann, which uh, I hope is not uh, misogynist or uh, anything like that, but there is a there is an interesting thing with her uh, and how she related to the media, because uh, as you said, uh, her persona, her public uh, persona, and the images of her are. Uh, reproduced on everything from the audiobooks to uh, you know what what have you yeah uh, the uh, thing for me is with the interviews she could have refused to give the interviews she she wanted to give those interviews like when you look at uh, some of the things that the very problematic uh, figure of uh, Marcel Reich Ranitsky uh, said about uh, uh, Bachmann uh, he uh, described meeting her for the first time when she pretended that she didn't know that she was a great poet and just put some poems there for this German critic to see. And it was very clear that, no, she staged it. Uh, and in a way, I mean, this this is then the really problematic uh, accusation by some people that uh, this uh, uh, her death uh, possibly could have been uh, not staged in a way, but set up in a way by herself. Uh, not to lead to death, but to really get media attention again at that point. Yeah, so I'm not making that argument, but I'm just pointing out that it, it has been made very often and very publicly, very loudly, sadly. Um, so my question would be uh, to you, how do you see uh, her as not responsible for the way that the media deals with her, including putting her images on everything, yeah, from the books to the audiobooks? Because... Again, I, I see this is a problematic question, but in a way she could have always said no to the interviews. She could have said no uh, when it came to publicizing very, very, you know, openly her relationships with uh, Frisch, with Celan and so on. Uh, in a way she was, it seems to me, uh, seeking this media attention and then uh, played with it. To a very, you know, in a very professional way. I mean, we can, we could say that she did this, uh, uh, you know, very self-assuredly, and she knew what she was doing. Uh, so, how do you, how would you respond to that? I think all of us who have all been engaging with Ingeborg Bachmann can have our own responses, but can we then just connect her to Elfrida Yelenek, who says you jolly well have to do these things, otherwise you don't have a, you don't stand a chance. You know, Frida Jelinek is very conscious of what she's doing. And maybe Ingeborg Bachmann didn't say that I'm doing it deliberately, but Elfrida Jelinek says, yes, that she is doing this theater, you know, how she dresses up, how she looks, you know, she's created her persona. And I think Ingeborg Bachmann probably, I mean, after all, she was, what, 30 years before that, no, needed to do it because after, with an exception of Ilse Eichinger, the group of 47, wasn't, wasn't particularly thrilled with women uh, writers, you know, so she had to push herself. This bit about her staging, her cigarette burning or whatever, that sounds a bit far-fetched to me, but who never know, who knows what she could have tried because she was a risk taker, wasn't she? You know, a comp I mean, even in her poetry, in that sense, um, the kind of poetry she wrote and then refusing to write poetry anymore for a long time. And accepting the fact that the male critics were calling her uh, prose trivial. 
in that sense, you know. But she continues with her prose. So it's, I think, uh, I think it's fine if she did it deliberately. In fact, it's good if she did it deliberately, you know. But then there's your answer why the picture, why her picture is everywhere. Because yeah, you but, seem to imply that it's death. problematic. That's after yeah, that, death, that is I correct. Find. Yeah, that is correct. Yeah, it's after her death that I find it problematic because now it's, it's commercial, you know. I mean, I don't think Marlena needs that. And yet the film also does it, you know. Isabella Huppert also does it. Create The person she has created in the eye in the film. And we don't have to go, I mean, Yelenek's script writing is good. I found it quite decent, actually, you know. But, oh my goodness, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Elfrida Yelenek, our goddess. <laughs> we can't say that. But yes, um, what was done even through the acting was actually create, recreating that myth, selling that myth of this fragile, what have you. So that's what I just meant that, you know, it just continues to be commercialized, but if she did it and she did it purposely, good for her. Thank I'm you sorry. so much. I agree. I don't know. No, you can say is... anything about Yelinek you want. It's yeah. absolutely fine. I'd just like to add uh, the English translation that we read did not have. Uh, it was fascinating. Bahamas. Yes. And it had, in fact, uh, a different kind of a picture there with half woman, half man. Yeah. Um, and so it was uh, not, they did not play to this um, yeah. trend. Yeah. You know? They did yeah. not. Yeah. yeah. I noticed yeah. that. It was actually quite a fascinating cover. Yeah, you know, when you said to me for a moment, I was a little bewildered. I said, "Where, where is Ingeborg Bachmann here? <laughs> Why is she not on the cover again?" <laughs> you know, Mother, My yeah. question would be maybe also to the style of writing. Maybe since we are also following the styles of writing uh, of all the women authors that we've been discussing, um, the last letters that she writes to Herr Richter, for example, you know, the way she writes, it's very interesting. The way the letters are being written. Uh, it's almost like typing and then deleting, retyping, deleting. Uh, I kept thinking, but then she obviously is writing it on paper and throwing it away. And at the end of every letter, she writes Vienna, three dots, an unknown author or woman, an unknown woman, right? Why does Vienna come so often there? I'm wondering because uh, we have had references in the beginning. We have talked about it. Is it some kind of um, um, a play doyer to Vienna, uh, to the, well, um, not, not, I mean, to the house uh, where she lives with Malina? I don't know, what is, what is it? Vienna, what, why is Vienna there all the time? It's not even the address there, or is it supposed to be read as an address? It's the unknown woman's place, identity place in that sense, no? And yet it, it precedes the place, the name. Yeah, the unknown woman, which is not a name at all in mm. that sense, no? So Vienna, the I would say it is the centrality of Vienna to her experiences. And why, the question could be, why not Unga Gassenland? Mm -hmm. Yes. Because Vienna is not Unga Gassenland. Vienna is just, is the larger frame which is also this place for universal prostitution, which is also so many other things, which is part of the, with Malina sitting in that military place, in that military uh, arsenal, he, is, he works there. You mm. Know? Mm. So yeah, we could think about that, why is she forces Vienna into it, mm. you know, as it were. Yeah. But yes, this constant, I mean, there's also her relationship with the postal service, which is actually very fascinating. Yes, yes. You know, which uh, one could also explore. Because in her legacy, that's what she's constantly talking about, you know, the postal service. And she's full of sympathy for this man who then refuses to deliver letters anymore. Yes. I, thought, I thought that was such a brilliant thing, you know. I mean, who thinks of things like that? So when you talk about styles of writing, I think she's got such a bunch, such a wild bunch of things to say at every point. That you never get tired. You're always just, you know, keeping up with her, I find. But yes, I think we should look at why she puts Vienna there. I, I don't think I've given it much thought as yet. Thank you. I'll think about it. And you, you probably will get there faster than me. <laughs> well, <it's young> <laughs>
And, and now maybe I can, my, uh, I, I fully agree that the question may be why it's not Ungar Gassenland, uh, but because it's only in the letters, right? It's at the bottom of the letters when she like uh, signs it off to the president and all the others, Herr Richter. Uh, uh, it's just the formatting uh, of a standard German letter actually to put the place on there. Now I haven't uh, read any, or I have never written an official Indian letter here like to the president of India or something. Uh, but I would put New Delhi uh, at the bottom of that before I sign my name, uh, if I were to do that, because I'm trained to do that. So that is just the format of the letter. But you are absolutely right that uh, the real, like how the postal service is brought into this and how uh, obviously it puts the place uh, uh, in the front uh, or like, you know, in the center of the stage, uh, that uh, is significant. But it is just the standard formatting. I would say, from also the, the what you showed in the presentation, it looks like a letter. So you put the uh, place you're writing it. Wouldn't one write the place under the signature? No, I mean that's kind of it's like uh, you you. I still see it in India in news. Like you would put uh, uh, like the byline. I don't know uh, NDTV New Delhi, NDTV Hyderabad. Like you yeah. would put that somewhere there. So it's like just. It used to be like that at the bottom of a letter. Now in German, you put it at the, where do you side, put it now? Right side. You put it somewhere. Yes, you put it somewhere on the right side near the top, I think. Uh, the top, yes. Uh, I only write emails. I don't write proper letters anymore. It's horrible. That's interesting. So it's like Vienna and then dot, 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 because she's anyway not interested about time. I mean, she time doesn't interest her. So the, the, the accuracy of time is not important, but the accuracy of place is important always. Um, because time is only today, no? There's no other yes, time. Yes. Or in the dream world. Right. Thank you so much. I I, I, I would like to think a little more about this. Because yeah, thank you, Jan Helga. Yeah. You're very welcome. But the spatial turn is very significant. Like everything you said about, uh, I mean, that actually helps me make uh, more sense of the novel because like all the students, I'm, you know, when looking at this kind of postmodern uh, uh, storytelling uh, approach to storytelling and of course other many other people have done it before uh, I think uh, uh, we've all also heard like you can't just use that as a reason to look at this novel but actually looking at the speciality of it uh, uh, helps me make more sense of it than I did when I read it long some time ago I will read it again with an eye to this all right uh, then maybe we could uh, conclude our session today um, Ashwat, would you like to please? Um, yeah, yes. please. <clears throat> Thank you all for joining us today for the fourth guest lecture on, of the online guest lecture series. Our next guest lecture will be uh, taking place in two weeks from now on 24th April on the topic, Finding Her Sexuality, Literary Reflections on Women's Liberation in Verena Stefan's Shedding. We will be having Dr. Shivani Parimal, Assistant Professor from the Department of German, SSPU Pune as a guest speaker, and Dr. Michael Stadler, DARD lecturer, JNU, New Delhi, as a chairperson of the talk. Once again, thank you to our speaker, Professor Madhu Sani, and thank you all. Thank you to all the attendees. Goodbye. May I also say thank you so much? Thank you so much, Shruti. It was wonderful. And thank you for the discussion also. I, I picked up a lot there too. Thank you so much, Ashwat, and thank you so much, Varshani. And thank you, everybody else. Thank you, Shruti, for having me. Thank you so much, Madhu. It was really a delightful experience. Thank you so much. <laughs> right, thank you. Thank you. Yes. All right. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.